Welcome and a wonderful evening, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues. It's wonderful to see you all here. Thank you so much for coming to celebrate 15 years of European digital rights with us. My name is Geraldine Bastian from the Berlin-based NGO Digitale Gesellschaft or Digital Society and I'm very happy to be the moderator for this evening and yeah, to be celebrating, like I said, together 15th, uh, the birth, sorry, <laughs> the birthday, 15th birthday party of Edri with all of you tonight. I want to start by giving you just a little bit of an overview of what we have planned. We have two keynotes from political representatives here in Brussels for you and then we're going to have a little bit of an extended fireside chat, basically. We have five of the founding members of IDRI here today to give a little bit of insight, what the motivations to found IDRI, what has happened since then, and an outlook to the future. So I'm very much looking forward to talking with them. And after that, of course, we have a party planned for all of you. So we hope you brought your dancing shoes and are gonna stay with us throughout the evening. Um, first up, it's my pleasure to introduce Sophie Intveld. She is a Dutch politician and a member of the Party Democrats 66. She was elected as a member of the European Parliament in 2004 and re-elected 2009 and 14. Please give her a warm, big round of applause. So, hello everybody. Um, let me start by saying happy birthday. And congratulations, congratulations on 15 years of very good work. And congratulations on your farsightedness at the time, because you created Edri just one year before Mark Zuckerberg created Facebook. Very <laughs> smart move. <laughs> so maybe we'll be invited to his 15th birthday party <laughs> next year. Now, this all, uh, everything sort of coincides because uh, I was first elected in 2004. So we have walked much of the road together. Uh, and very often it was an uphill walk, but we've also reached very high peaks. We've passed some very, very important legislation and sometimes we've been celebrating landmark court rulings. Uh, but of course, there have also been very, very difficult times and there's still some difficult times ahead too. So I think it is very good that, uh, that we stick together. Um, in 2004, I took over from uh, my predecessor, Johanna bogert Quack. Maybe some of you will remember her. She was the very first European Parliament Rapporteur on PNR in 2003. And she managed at the time to secure a majority in the European Parliament for challenging the EU-US PNR agreement in court successfully. Uh, the sad side is of course that we are now 15 years down the road and the file is still not closed. But I got into her footsteps. Now I was asked to say a few words about my personal drive for the topics of privacy and data protection. And in a way I was thinking that's a very funny question because well, it seems so e self-evident. The right to privacy and data protection are fundamental rights. They are legal rights enshrined in law. They are enforceable in court. Um, and they are on the par with, for example, freedom of speech, uh, the right to family life, or the ban on slavery. And none of those fundamental rights are ever disputed. And if I were to campaign for the freedom of speech or the ban of slavery, I would not be asked why. I would not be asked to explain or to justify, but somehow the right to privacy and data protection still have to be justified. They are seen as lesser rights, as some sort of you know, political, uh, frivolous, usually left-wing, which is terrible, left-wing is terrible these days, uh, something political, ideological, but it's not. It is a legal right. It's in the treaties, let's not forget that. So defending them is the natural thing to do. Privacy and data protection are therefore not negotiable. There is no such thing as a balance between privacy and security or a trade-off between data protection and business interests, just as we do not accept a trade-off on other fundamental rights. Privacy and data protection are closely connected to other rights and freedoms the right to free speech, or the right to equal treatment, the right to mental and physical integrity. 
the right to be able to make a well-informed choice in elections, for example, as we have seen recently. Privacy and data protection are also a protective wall against manipulation and abuse of power because privacy and data protection are very much about power and freedom. Your personal data are about power. A freedom for me personally is one of the most important values. And I don't only mean economic freedom, but also our personal individual freedom. And in particular, vis-a-vis -vis the government for governments or authorities. Because too easily we forget that governments are actually supposed to be controlled by us and not the other way around. And that seems to be forgotten. And I was asked about my personal motivation. Uh, it, it is very closely linked to uh, my membership of my political party, Democrat 66. It was founded in, yes, 1966, as a can kind of uh, anti-establishment party. Some people find it hard to imagine that we were once anti-establishment, but it's true. Um, but for me, that is still the, 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 the core um, objective of the founding fathers of my party was to empower citizens vis-a-vis -vis the government. It was about, uh, let's say, breaking the arrogance of power uh, and also the monopoly of political parties, but very much about empowering the citizen. And that has always been the theme throughout my work and uh, the work of my political party. Now, coming back to today, I suppose that you actually got the best anniversary gift you could imagine by Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> because clearly Facebook has guessed your deepest wishes. Because never before have we seen such a steep rise in awareness. And I'm delighted about that. I have to say that for the last two weeks, I felt like floating on a pink cloud, you know. Because for 14 years, people told me privacy, I mean, honestly, I mean, at best, they thought, you know, I was a harmless nutcase, and at worst, they told me that I'm, I'm in the way of the fight against terrorism and I have blood on my hands. But I always had to defend it, and now all of a sudden, you know, privacy is really cool, or hot, or both. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm really happy, uh, but w when I hear lots of people um, being terribly outraged and shocked, I confess that I cannot help thinking uh, under what stone have you been living for the last 15 years? Um, because if you find out now that companies like Facebook are massively collecting your personal data and uh, doing all sorts of stuff with them that they weren't supposed to do, then, um, I don't know, probably you've been in the desert or something. Uh, but I'm not complaining because I think the wake-up call is most welcome. So now I hope that after the wake-up call we will not go back to snooze mode. And I hope that we will draw some lessons. For example, from now on, to actually pay heed to advice of experts. Experts like EDRI, or the EDPS, or Working Party 29, and maybe two or three smart MEPs. Um, <laughs> you know, this is also the, the, the sort of I told you so era. Um, because I hope all those politicians, including colleagues of mine, who are now loudly denouncing the practices of Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, will use their newly gained insights when they will vote, for example, on the e-privacy regulation, on, <laughs> on new PNR agreements, or revised PNR agreements, or on Privacy Shield. But I have to say, I'm not 100% reassured, having listened to the statements of some of my colleagues uh, in the debate on Privacy Shield this morning. I think even if they were shocked about Cambridge Analytica, they're clearly not shocked enough. <laughs> because they seem to forget that Cambridge Analytica and Facebook are in Privacy Shield and use the Privacy Shield to transfer the data to the United States. But of course, being coherent is not a basic requirement of politics. <laughs> uh. <laughs> now, I also hope that the wake-up call and the general indignation will not focus only on Facebook and the use of personal data by businesses, but also on the ever-expanding data-grabbing powers of public authorities, in particular intelligence and security services. Because you thought that Cambridge Analytica was bad? You were worried about Zuckerberg using your data? 
Well, wait until you see the US Cloud Act and President Trump, Trump getting his fingers all over your data stored in Europe. But of course, the European Commission will not tolerate this American territorial overreach. And as always, the Commission will be very firm and assertively defend the rights of European citizens and the jurisdiction of the EU. Uh, no, sorry, that's the wrong speaking note. Uh, th this was actually my wish list for the Tooth Fairy. So, sorry. Because in reality, the member states have already mandated the European Commission to negotiate away European citizens' rights, as always. And as always, we will do whatever we can to stop them. Now, in recent weeks, many people have closed their Facebook accounts. Uh, and as much as I have understanding and sympathy for that, I do not think it's the way. First of all, because it's largely symbolical, as you cannot really fully protect your privacy. You cannot escape, not even if you go and live naked in the desert, because you'll still be spotted by a drone or a satellite. Uh, but also because next to Facebook, your data are being held by another 10,000 or so other companies. But apart from all those practical considerations, I also do not think that we should cap capitulate. We should not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Because, yes, I think we can still say, Facebook and other services have also brought us fantastic new opportunities. So let's embrace the new opportunities, but also regulate and enforce better. And let's not forget that the internet era is very young, is roughly one generation old. And it's a bit like uncharted territory, like a new land that we are exploring. And just like pioneers, we have to make the new land inhabitable, create roads and infrastructure, draw maps and navigation signs, draw up rules and laws, create enforcement powers. And we are in the process of doing just that. And organizations like EDRI are a bit like the pioneers, like the scouts. They're traveling ahead, exploring the new territory and showing the way. So let me conclude by once again congratulating you on 15 years of excellent and important work. Your work is vital for a healthy and robust democracy. And I'm looking forward to many more years of good cooperation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophie, for that wonderful opening. As our second uh, opening keynote speaker, I would like to welcome Wojtek Wiewierowski on stage, who is the Assistant European Data Protection Supervisor. Please give him also a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, I really treat it as a honor. Uh, because it shows uh, that uh, this uh, cooperation that we have between the public authorities which are dealing with the data protection, with the privacy protection, and uh, the protection of other fundamental rights, uh, and the civic society is still alive uh, and is the extremely important part uh, of what we do. And this is actually something which I want to say about uh, and uh, maybe taking one of the examples of this kind of uh, cooperation. Well, uh, unlike... Uh, Sophie, I didn't come to uh, this place uh, because of my political career in the political party. I always thought myself being neutral, meaning I have my political opinions, but they don't count to what I do. Because uh, I thought I'm neutral, I'm taught I'm non-political. Not apolitical, but non-political. And I thought that I know quite a lot. Uh, when I started my work in the public administration in 2006, I already had uh, seven years of uh, experience in the private business. I actually started my work, although I'm a lawyer by, by education, and I did my PhD in constitutional law, I started my professional work in the IT company, and I actually started as a data miner. Uh, my job was to find the public resources uh, that are available and to create out of them the information retrieval system that would enable lawyers and uh, public administration, but also any kind of companies, uh, to profile the clients, to profile the customers, to profile those they wanted to do the contracts with. Later on, I moved uh, to uh, work in academia in the field of the IT law. 
But when I started my job in 2006 in the public administration, I started in the Ministry of Interior. And I was the advisor of the Minister of Interior. And later on, the head of the Department of E-Government in my country of origin in the Ministry of Interior, responsible for interoperability of the resources. And that was the moment at which I met uh, the NGOs dealing with the privacy. As you know, in my country of origin, there is a strong uh, NGO dealing with it, which is Panopticon, also the member of EDRI. And uh, actually, that was Panopticon who started to ask me the questions that I always should ask myself, but I never did. And I thought that I'm prof pretending, uh, that I'm uh, protecting something uh, which is important for me, which is, of course, the data flow, but also the security, and security also understood as the security against crimes. And being in the Ministry of Interior, I was always in favor of having a strong uh, law enforcement uh, authorities in my country, because I wanted them to, pr to protect me. But at the same time, I still had in the back of my mind the thing which happened in 1983. In 1983, I was 12 years old. And that was the time when there was a martial law in my country of origin, just after the patch by the communist, uh, uh, by the communist, uh, let's say, veton part of the uh, party. And we had the visit of the policeman in my school, in my primary school. And he was talking with the children of my age, being 12, 11, 13. And he was explaining how the world is organized, how the police is organized. Uh, and he touched the point which stayed in my mind for years. He said, don't be surprised that we surveil the people. Don't be surprised that during the martial law, we are listening to the public communication and to the telephone communication, that we read your, e your mails, snail mails. You should not be afraid of that, because we are not looking for the people like you. We are looking for the bad people. <laughs> and uh, we are only interested in bad people. And then to my 12 years old mind came the question, but who is a bad person? And who decides who is the bad person? And then there was a time when somebody explained to me, yeah, it is decided in the law. And I could understand with my 12 years old mind that I'm not in the democratic country. And these people who are dealing with uh, my security over the bad people are not necessarily the ones that I would like to see there. So when Panopticon started to ask me the questions that I should ask myself being the public uh, and uh, the public uh, um, officer, I started to think, okay, probably these are the things that I have to remember day after day and remind myself day after day. Later on, when I, when I applied for the job of the Data Protection Authority, I've been questioned by the NGOs. There is a good tradition in my country of origin that the candidate for the DPA it has the monitoring process done by the NGOs. I had three hours of uh, hard question and answer time with the NGOs, and it was finished with a kind of summary that was sent to the public, which, by which among the other things said, okay, this candidate is probably professionally well, but it seems to be surprising that somebody who, had, uh, who, who was the high officer in the Ministry of Interior is going to pretend right now that he will be defending human rights. And it stayed in my mind as well that I'm the one to show what is the real uh, job of the public authority, what is the real job of the controlling power. I'm not the member of the NGO dealing with privacy. And there are many situations in which also as the European Data Protection Supervisor, I have different point of view than the people who are dealing with it. But there are a lot of places, a lot of moments uh, when we are on the same side and we are saying the same things. But first of all, I think uh, this is an education process. This is Joe, this is Anna, this is Sierra who is here, who are teaching me how to understand the things which are going on around, even if my, in my humble opinion, I was well prepared for that. So what do I know? Can I prove what I know about what's going on in my country? 
how can I show that the Data Protection Authority really can do his work? In 2012, at the beginning of the discussion about GDPR and the directive and the so-called police directive, uh, there was an interparliamentary meeting in the European Parliament uh, where there were the members of the European Parliament and the members of the national parliaments. And uh, I had an opportunity to, to take part in the panel which was dealing with the directive on police and law enforcement authorities. And being assured by some of the members of the panel that everything is under control and there was a good supervision power, the good supervision system in the EU countries, I actually openly asked them, do you think so? I'm probably, I, I can probably Im imagine that there is something like that in France, maybe in the UK, maybe in the Netherlands. I can say it because I don't know, and you tell me. But I can tell you one, it's not in my country. Because I, as a data protection authority, have no clue what the secret services do with the data. And I have very few information on what the police does. After that, it was well shown that this is not the problem of my country of origin only. But I said to these people, if you think that you know what's going on in 28 countries of the European Union, you are wrong, and I assure you that. And if you want to have uh, the real, well-working uh, law enforcement authorities in your countries, and I do want it, then you need the supervision on that. Not necessarily by the Data Protection Authority, but there has to be a supervision. Supervision uh, is the condition sine qua non for giving the big data analytic tools uh, and all kind of other analytics uh, to the law enforcement authorities. But if so, we have to decide who should supervise, how should supervise, what does it mean, the supervision? And I'm very happy that we have a directive right now. I'm very happy that the European Parliament decided uh, to force the other legislators uh, to have the package consisting of GDPR that everybody wanted to have and the police directive. But I really try to observe right now how the implementation of the process looks like. Eh? And I'm afraid that my speech from this conference in 2012 is still absolutely valid and still should be there. So we don't need to agree in 100% with the NGOs. We don't need uh, to pretend uh, that we do the same things. No, but definitely we need uh, as data protection authorities to be open on the NGOs and to be open to learn from you how the world really looks like. And in my opinion, ADRI has uh, one big advantage over any other association, federation that exists right now in Europe. And this is the fact that it's present in so many countries with so different members. And you, have you, you can use uh, the power of the synergy where one of you is helping the others to understand the things uh, and to create the front uh, that sometimes is visible in this side, sometimes in the other side, sometimes in the, uh, the, this dossier or the other dossier. And that was the success of this 15 years uh, of ADRI. And I would love to have ADRI and the other platforms like that uh, present. And I can tell you that uh, many of the data protection authorities uh, share this point of view. And they want also the NGOs, the civic society, to be present uh, at all the international events uh, that the data protection authorities and the privacy authorities organize. And uh, just half a year before the International Conference of Data Protection Commissioners uh, and, data pr and Privacy Commissioners, which is going to be organized here in Brussels in October this year, I would like to tell you that as it was when I organized this conference in Warsaw in 2013, uh, that today it's also the big part of our program. Unfortunately, uh, after 2013, uh, Public Voice never met at the uh, International Conference for different reasons partly political, partly organizational. But we are sure 
that 2018 will be the time when this practical cooperation that is us learning from you and you hearing what we see in the top, the of, top of the iceberg uh, that we are supervising uh, uh, is still um, uh, present and is still developed. Thank you very much and I hope you will have a good time today and I hope you will have a time to discuss for a while about the practical implication of cooperation with different kind of uh, public authorities, uh, including those uh, who are created in order to defend uh, the human rights and the fundamental rights here in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wojtek and Sophie, for highlighting the importance of EDRI and also its national member organizations in basically educating and, of course, advocating for digital rights uh, across Europe. Um, we're now, as you can see, going to have a little bit of a transition on stage to get ready for our panel. And I'm going to use this time to start introducing our panelists. Um, so please don't mind the gentlemen behind me on stage who are just going to transform from band to panel setting and um, you can focus on me over here. So as I said, we have five of the founding members who were all together once in a room about 15 years ago and decided Edry would be a good thing here with us today. And I'm really excited to be sitting and exchanging with them on stage. And I'd like to introduce them all to you briefly before then we all come and sit down. So first up, uh, we have Erich Möchel with us. He's an award-winning investigative journalist. He's also a board member of the Board of Advisors of Privacy International and one of the founders of the first Austrian Big Brother Awards in 99. Um, his current home base is a broadcasting um, organization in Austria, ISFM ORF. Next up, we have Ian Brown, who's a researcher and an author. His work is mainly focused on private policy issues, public policy issues around information and the internet, and of course, particularly about privacy and copyright. One of his recent publications is the book Regulating Code, Good Governance, and Better Regulation in the Information Age. Third party with us today is Andreas Kisch, who's the current president of the EDRI board, and he's also president of the Austrian Organization or Association of Internet Users and the Forum Data Protection. He's also a technical expert on data protection and um, it, with one of the organizations he works with, responsible for certifying <coughs> IT services and products for their data conformity. So a very busy man. <laughs> and third up, we have Shruda Nas. Until recently, she was the Dutch Data Protection um, Authority, um, with the Dutch Data Protection Authority, um, as internet and telecoms expert. And previous to that, she was the co-director of Bits of Freedom. She's also one of the founding members, as I mentioned, and also responsibility for the Edrigram, which I'm sure you all love reading, but we're going to be talking about that a little bit later on on stage. And last but not least, we have Andreas Lena with us, who is a digital security expert from Berlin and also works with the Tor project on internet and anonymity. Please welcome all of them with me on stage. Wonderful. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here tonight. So obviously, I'd like to start out with a question of how things began. There must have been some kind of collaboration between digital rights activists across Europe, because we have people from four different countries with us on stage here today. So um, I'm guessing you were all working together in some capacity. Why then did you find yourself in one space and decide it was necessary to found Idri? Let's do the rounds. Um, Let's start with you, Eric. Well, let's start. You wouldn't have expected a journalist to sit here. So, <laughs> as this is an entre situation, I can confess it. I'm a double agent, and I've <laughs> always been. But it was out of strict nece necessity. When I got on the internet, I was on the Usenet before, in around 1994. I thought, wow, this is a territory for journalism doing investigative things until I learned that there are no letters but just postcards here. <laughs> that we would send everything for every server to read. So I said, 
So I rethought that and said, shit, excuse me, it's an entrepreneur situation and we can use this word. This thing is not secure. You send postcards. Then came, then I found, about, uh, found out about crypto. We need this. Ah, it's not ready. How can we do it? So we pushed, started pushing this, and to our astonishment, there was not much resistance, and the banks were delighted that, were, that we were already on this turf. They really told us, oh, thank you. We saved a lot of money. We don't need astroturfing because you are here. So, and that's how we came into these, into these crypto things. And after a year or so, I was in the midst of things because there was an office where crypto was kept hostage, so to say. They didn't allow the experts of strong crypto. Is in Vienna. I went there. I was the first journalist to get in. And things developed so quickly, we couldn't, we couldn't uh, even realize what was going on. And after a while, we had won the crypto wars with the help of the banksters. Yeah, it's always very unusual alliances that win on the internet. And we were euphoric. Wow, we want it. Now we have secure communications. We can have it because the browsers do SSL. Yes, said the banks. We'll use this to close, to close our, our offices and, make the pe and, and force the people to do the work themselves. That was the motivation of the banks. And so, so we were there, and we t it was all with our American friends, American Civil U Liberties Union, EFF, and the others who helped us. <laughs> and we had hardly won the crypto wars to our own astonishment. It was the first campaign, and we won it. And then came 9-11, and a notion of surveillance started to roll above us. So was it basically the realization that obviously these are all international, I'm going to stay with your uh, rhetoric battles to fight, and although we might have our national legislation and our national organizations, there's not going to be much movement unless we unite in some kind of way? Was that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we, we found each other easily at the time because there were a few active voices critiquing the de commercial development of internet. And so we immediately, all of us realized we have to come together. So what brought you to Berlin? That was funny. <laughs> uh, I just only realized yesterday that the person who took all those vague pictures with the red eyes was actually me. <laughs> I, I don't have any recollection of taking pictures because it was way before the smartphone age. <laughs> We but actually found some photos of this founding meeting that we might be uh, giving you a sneak insight to in the back here later on. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I accompanied Maurice, who had done then just founded Bits of Freedom, the Dutch NGO. And one year later, I decided oh, I'll quit my job at the ISP and I'll start working with Maurice for Bits of Freedom because the people here are so much cooler. <laughs> <laughs> I think probably many people in the room have found themselves in that situation and made a good decision in their life. <laughs> um, Andreas, how about you? Um, is it um, something that you look back and think, we were all just right there at the right time and right place? Or did you maneuver that right time and right place? Uh, well, I think we, we very much understood that we were fighting a more or less hopeless fight at our national countries because when a law uh, comes to national countries, it's already deci decided on the European level and there is only uh, uh, implementation taking place where you can uh, move a little bit, but you can't change the big picture. And uh, it was clear to us that we need to go to the European level in order to really change the things. And we need to do it commonly because most of our organizations, we've been 10 organizations at the time, uh, were run by volunteers, so people doing spending their spare time uh, with, with making the world better in the digital area, uh, space, 
and uh, so we, it, there was a, a strong need for cooperation, there was a strong need to uh, bring our different skills together. There have been hackers, there have been lawyers, there have been all kinds of people uh, interested in different things and we decided to bring all of that together to uh, have a common spare time activity for most of us and travel to Brussels, uh, go to the meetings with the parliament, with the commission, with uh, everybody who wanted to speak with us or who we wanted to speak to and uh, to try to change the world. And that's how it started. So the process since then has obviously been a longer one, and I would uh, encourage you, in case you haven't found it yet, there's a fun little room, which is a little bit of a museum exhibition with things for you to discover, but it also has an Idri timeline along the line uh, with the founding in 2002 and everything that's happened since then. Founding an international organization with a lot of different kind of national member organizations, and as Wojtek uh, pointed out, they are very, very different in nature, can be a very difficult t thing. And there were already 10 founding organizations in the beginning. Um, obviously, like you said, there were many people with very few means. How did you start things off in the beginning? If you knew already it had to be some kind of professional organization, what were the sort of forming structures? Did you all basically decide to chip in a little bit or how did that work, Ian? Yes, li literally, and that I think that's one a great thing about the whole digital rights community then and now that it's full of very passionate people and I mean, it's wonderful that Edry is now so much more professional and organized and well-funded, but uh, you know, lots, of the, lots of the people in this room, I'm sure, have put in a lot of volunteer time and, and even resources themselves to, to make things work. So as, as Shura was saying, and as, as Wojciech said as well, obviously as the EU has developed and Brussels has become more and more important, we all, I think similar to, as Eric was saying, we all realized we all got started in our own um, national policy debates, but realized shit, you know, we missed this really important stuff happening in Brussels and it's passed and it's too late. Or, you know, we can just tweak it as it gets implemented in our own countries. And um, we saw that with the copyright directive, for example. A, a lot of us very interested as, as well as in privacy and surveillance, also copyright, digital rights management and so on. And we were not quite early enough with the 2001 copyright directive, but then I think it was 2004, there was a intellectual, intellectual property rights enforcement directive where we all worked together very effectively and amazingly, it felt at the time, actually stopped the EU criminalizing IPR infringement. So that's the first big success? And, that, and it's great when that happens because sometimes digital rights campaigning, you're, you've, you're small organizations often, you're fighting very powerful interests, you know, the sort of the rights holders of the world, big pharma, uh, intelligence agencies, government security and, and defense and so on. So when you can get those successes, then that's r really morale boosting and encourages everyone to, to keep working. And I'm gonna close the round, but then we're gonna have a bit more of a ping pong. But Andreas, obviously I also want you to comment uh, on your experience having been there 15 years ago and part of this founding group of people. So what I think was clear to all of us in, in 2002 was how dramatically the scenery for civil rights had shifted after 9-11. Um, and simultaneously, whereas we had previously worked in our national countries with our national governments, um, we'd seen that the European Union came to exert more, more force than it did so before and became a more dominant entity and that it would require civil society to also work in, in Brussels, as Ian just mentioned. And, um, also simultaneously, governments started wanting to regulate the net, which had up until then been an elite debate between academics and, and corporate entities. And when all this came together simultaneously, um, we thought on how to, to answer to this and found that there was no European public. And I think that's still a thing that we'll have to fight for the next 15 years, that there is, for various reasons, be it the language barrier, be it travel, be national debate still being valid and important to the national governments, um, that there was a need to have a supranational entity to coordinate those and as has been numerously said, let it no longer be a volunteer effort because you'll just burn the people. Yeah, I mean, I think the key word that you just said about the um, European public is a very important one because obviously in order to sustain our work, we also need to make it seen and make it understood by the people that we're essentially working for. So you started the Idri Gram, <laughs> so the very, very beginning days of Idri, and um, did you do that with exactly the same sort of um, thought in mind? Yeah, 
Exactly. We, we, we were so inspired when we looked at the USA with, indeed, with what Eric already said, like ACLU and EFF, but they had such a massive audience. I must say I underestimated <laughs> uh, how difficult it was to make all these European people read English. We had a lot of volunteers in the beginning that made translations. I remember in Moldavian and in Belarus and in German and it was an incredible effort from all these people, but w we had hoped that uh, at least writing this newsletter in English would give all these professionals mm. all around Europe like an easy entrance into European developments that they could use internally to at least, you know, uh, counter the myth that is still prevalent in every national parliament. Oh, it's Brussels doing this to us. Well, no, it's your own ministry. <laughs> That is right. And to, to, to sort of unmask this myth, we thought Edry Graham would be extremely helpful. And it reached a lot of professionals, but like the popular outreach that we dreamt of in the very beginning, like an ACLU newsletter, uh, we never managed that. Is that a new sort of hope coming up now that it was mentioned, obviously, in Sophie's opening keynote, there's a different momentum at the moment happening? I think we learned earlier it's 24,000 people who read the Edry newsletter today, which is a fantastic number, <laughs> but there are so many millions and millions of people living in the, in the European Union, right? And this essentially you want to target all of them. Do you see this being a critical point in time to reach a different kind of public sphere? Uh, I think uh, that uh, it's, uh, there is a change in, in, in the audience that also needs to be addressed, I think, because uh, from in the beginning we, we had to do a lot of educational uh, work uh, towards decision makers where they first had to, understood, uh, had to understand how technology works, what, how the internet works, how all of these things are connected and why it is relevant to, to even regulate uh, things or not regulate in the way that, uh, that they intended to do. And uh, therefore, Edric Graham from the beginning was a an, an, uh, uh, very important media to, to uh, translate technology to, to normal people, to policy makers, to, to people in the field to, to understand what is going on. And I think now the, the debate uh, reached the general public, obviously, with uh, the discussion now and, and also previous events. And uh, we also need, of course, to, to find another language to also address this authority. We need to maintain, of course, the specialized uh, community of the now 24,000 people that are uh, subscribed to Educram because they still need this quality of information. Uh, but at the same time, I think we, we also need to address the, the, the general public, the, the uh, people out there who are looking for help and, and uh, want to understand what they can do uh, in order to, to make things better and, and not being exploited by, by multinational companies uh, making money out of their, of their data. Uh, do you think, I mean, this has been a learning curve for most, um, most activists, I think most of us doing translating basically the topics that we're working on on a very expert level to the general public. So I'm addressing you and your double, double agent function as a journalist as well. Have we learned to do a better job or is that something that we still struggle with to communicate the importance of what we're actually doing here? Uh, well, I think things have become much better than they were. They looked at this in the early years as madmen talking about things they wouldn't understand even, and talking about something being important that's happening on the net that nobody of the audience knew. So that was the situation, the situation then. And I just want to add, my role in Edry was a very humble role. And I was just in to get out again because I'm a journalist and not a campaign. Well, uh, yes, uh, I'm a journalist here. Yeah. I'm not a campaigner. And I just did this job because there were no people around to do it. I had to do it myself to secure my own communication for my job. So uh, we started to mix in everything that was digital and new, and we would not stop from any, refrain from any topic. Then came the software patents. There was industry demanding patentability of software. And you know, the software uh, renewing cycles and the patent cycles. This does not fit at all. 
But Eric, why, uh, she asked you about the, uh, the style of communication. Why did we manage to convince the general public that software patents were bad? And why does it still take us forever to explain that building backdoors in encryption is a bad idea? No problem, because uh, <laughs> we had the programmers on our side. There was a demonstration of 350 programmers in Vienna in 2003 outside of the patent office. These were not our people, but these were just free programmers and they were mad that somebody else would patent their skills and their methods and their ideas. And everybody accused Microsoft and IBM and trivial patents and this was all around. And here we are in the year 2018. You know, who wanted to do the software patents? Who was behind all this? Who was hiding behind all this? The auto industry. It was the auto industry that wanted to patent software together with hardware. The commission always told us, what did they tell us? Oh no, we won't, don't want to patent any software at all, only together with hardware. Do you have an idea now when they started to plan these foul tricks <laughs> they did and they are doing until now? It was in 2003 and software patents was their vehicle. Do you think though, um, Ian, uh, you already raised your hand to come in on this, I'm just gonna combine it with a question. I mean, obviously, it was the internet was still young, so we, but so were, so is politics, in a sense, maybe a different game? And what, do you think there were different sort of abilities to influence when many people didn't have a deep understanding of how they could sort of harness these technologies for their power execution on the political side, but also maybe corporations? I mean, obviously there were po powerful corporations back then already, but maybe on a different scale than the ones exerting political influence today? I would put it a bit differently because I think over the years, certainly many of our colleagues and friends, we thought, okay, surely as more and more people use the internet, including politicians, and understand it, they'll realize how important these issues are. And I'm sad to say we <laughs> have still not quite got there, in, at least in the UK. But I think one p very positive thing to say is um, that the EDRI members, the NGOs at the national level, and EDRI itself, I think have been very good at sort of professionalizing their communications operations. So obviously we have social media now, which we did not have <laughs> 15 years yeah. ago. I think uh, the Edry team does a great job in using that. But I, I think as well, just doing like really sometimes very what seems like quirky um, sort of media events can have a really big impact. So going back to this, um, this directive, the, I think it was the pirates at the time, hi it was really insane. I think far the farmer people hired a boat to sail around the parliament in Strasbourg saying, you know, vote for this directive. And then the pirate party hired their own boat to say, no, vote against this. And it got so much media attention because it was so odd. There was a, there were also, there was, a, um, there was a great campaign around the same time called Defective by Design, where a lot of campaigners dressed up in bright yellow hazmat suits <laughs> and um, handed out leaflets, and I did this, and I was so annoyed I couldn't find a photo of me in the yellow hazmat suit for tonight, um, handing out leaflets outside Apple stores when they were still like pushing DRM in their products, saying, you know, don't let Apple get away with this. <laughs> How, have we lost that public momentum a little bit? <laughs> I mean, like, I'm looking at you coming Since from the German <laughs> side here, because <laughs> we've had a number of times where we were able to mobilize a lot of people in the public to come forth and speak out for digital human rights, but we've struggled with that in the last years, I would say. I'd agree, but I still think it works pretty good given the things normal people have to catch up with every day and what is predominantly on their mind. And I vividly remember being at university reading constitutional law and let me assure you, it wasn't vivid. <laughs> and seeing this play out in the streets with people dressing in costumes and, and making it tangible, uh, that was a fantastic thing to see. And as Joe reminded me previously tonight, um, the good thing about Edry is that we both have, a level, have gained a level of professionalism that we can use to institute such things, but we also have 
the level of being the outsider at times still, especially at the, at the national NGO level. And I think that's working out fine. And the only job will be to convince more people to say, hey, given the fact that you have so many tangible issues and sorrows at the moment, please be aware this might not be as tangible today, but it's going to be soon. And no matter what I think of the way it's being framed at the moment, the fact is that we have a debate that Facebook is ever present in the media and that nowadays you can talk to the normal person on the street and they'll know what the issue is. And I think that and gives and me a lot of hope. And at least we've got the GDPR. Eh? We managed, all of us, to convince enough politicians to adopt really good privacy regulation. I mean, the USA will still struggle for the next 15 years uh, and, and you know, have hearings in Congress where, where company uh, CEOs make promises. But we have regulation. <laughs> so this is a wonderful achievement. We've already m reached, ADRI and all the national member organizations have already, can count that as a big success that they've managed to reach out across parties to achieve this regulation. And I think, uh, as both Sophie and Wojciech said, it's really powerful when NGOs manage to engage with politicians and with regulators uh, and with the courts to achieve these goals as well, because we were all talking earlier about the data retention directive, and that to me is just the most stunning, vic you know, stunning victory when, when the, you know, the Court of Justice decision that said this directive is so bad, we are going to annul it. And I just, uh, you know, I, I had been, fi we had all been fighting this for a decade plus, and then that was just, <gasps> finally. <laughs> Definitely uh, one of the key success moments, especially looking at how pan-European collaboration can work on a topic. Absolutely, and it also shows, I think, uh, how, how different dossiers hit for topics with different kinds of communication, especially on, on data retention. We had big uh, demonstrations in Germany uh, fighting against it. We, we had big demonstrations in Austria. We had uh, court cases. We had, uh, in the early days, uh, we, we uh, I'm sure was, was uh, heavily involved in, in collecting 15,000 signatures uh, against the data retention directive uh, that was they were handed over to the European Parliament even before the directive was uh, was adopted. And so we, we used over these 10 years a, a multitude of, of uh, different communications and campaign styles and, and legal action and what have you. And we, we won in Germany, we won in uh, Austria, we won in, in many other countries the, the national uh, fights uh, before the court. And then finally in Ireland and in, in Austria we managed to, to uh, have it uh, taken to the, to the European Court of Justice and there we had our final win on the directive, but uh, it uh, took a lot of time, it took a lot of effort, but it also was a, a very, very good showcase, in my opinion, how cooperation about our NGOs can work, how uh, the different skills then that we bring together uh, can be utilized in order to reach a common goal and, and do something good. So I think that's a, a really good showcase. So <laughs> data retention, we had software patents and GDPR. Would you count those as the three biggest successes over the last 15 years, or are there other things that you think stand out equally? I think a lot of successes are national as well. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the biggest successes of EDRI is how, how organizations with only two or three people uh, staff are able to participate in all these different topics on a European level, while they can only focus on one or two topics nationally. So I think the, vi the, the key victories just mentioned are very visible, but I think the, the long-term success is the sustainability of the national organizations that can actually get involved in the European level in like 20 or 30 different files, thanks to the Brussels staff. And I mean, many of these organizations, and I'm sure this is true for all of you in your respective context, still struggle with getting enough funding to have paid staff. So basically there's, I think there's like one organization that core funds um, other NGOs and otherwise it's, um, it's donations, right? So there's still only a handful of really professional people working in the scene. And I, I wanted particularly to thank Vera Franz who's here at the back um, because... Um, that is that one organization, yes. <laughs> I think Vera has, has uh, Who's, who's been working for the Open Society Foundations for many years and ha I think was very far-sighted in seeing how important these issues were mm -hmm. and in funding a lot of the national NGOs and the, the Brussels operation. Um, I hope um, OSF is, is pleased at you know, the, the amazing successes in that their, their long-term funding has, has led to and hopefully that will also 
as people watch, you know, Zuckerberg being grilled in Congress and so on, will realize these are not just very niche geek issues. These are incredibly important society-wide issues, and um, the funding will not be quite such a battle in the next 15 years. Hopefully. I mean, I think you're right. It should definitely be pointed out that the sustainability of the member organizations, but EDRI itself, is one of the biggest successes. Um, it's, I think it's been really clear in some of the examples that we cited that this is a long-term job and you need some kind of reliable structure in order to be able to take part in these political discourses. And it hasn't been easy, we, we have to say. We, we had uh, two attempts to, to finally get uh, an office in Brussels. Uh, the first time uh, we, we had a director here in, in Brussels for I think a year or something like that. Uh, and uh, we were not successful in finding funding to, to continue with him. Uh, and uh, therefore we, we had to, to step back, take a step back, uh, still uh, start to, uh, and continue with, with the, the local volunteers to uh, traveling to Brussels on their own budget uh, in order to, to have the meetings in the European in Parliament and only at the second time uh, we've been successful and I think this is one of the of the very uh, important moments of, of EDRI when, when we manage this and when I came here I thought what were the, the most important and, and the most changing situations uh, for EDRI in his history and I saw myself sitting in a, in a room about six square, square meters with one desk, two chairs and one tiny shelf and uh, Joe and I sitting there signing his contract making him the director <laughs> of EDRI and <laughs> <laughs> with, with zero resources, but, uh, but a little funding for, for, for his salary. And uh, that's how we started. And this changed the entire organization until today, because this uh, made it possible for us to, to uh, be here in Brussels, to have a base here, to, to uh, have uh, ears and eyes and, and a voice here in Brussels without uh, traveling all the time and, and be depending on what uh, information is available over the internet on what goes on, go is going on in Brussels, that we actually had the possibility to be there. And this uh, was, a, was a very uh, important change, I think. and, and uh, from there came a, a huge amount of professionalization of our work uh, where all the member organizations uh, profited a, a really a big deal uh, to, to have this representation here and all the great people that uh, worked with us in the meantime and still work with us. And uh, so I think this is one of the key moments, but still until today, and it's still important, we need the member organizations uh, to, to contribute and they need to, to do the work on the national level. We need them to bring the expert knowledge here to Brussels, uh, to, to educate the Brussels office on, on the technical things and all, all the of, the of the expertise and get expertise on what is going on in Brussels, how Brussels works, how the, all the, the political area and theme here in Brussels uh, is uh, how you can deal with that to bring this back to the member states and to the organizations and only this uh, double approach, having the national organizations, the volunteers and having our professional pro staff here in Brussels makes the success of this organization. I think this is always also the way forward uh, that, we, that we need to utilize and where we need to go on and make it better. Yeah, absolutely. You want to come in, Eric? I mean, we see the necessity for the sustainability of an organization like Edry just upon the topics that have been with us since the very founding days. You started off by mentioning you know, the fight against terrorism and, and all the infringements on on civil rights um, and human rights that that brings, and that's obviously as present today as it was 15 years ago. Yes, but the difference is we are not outsiders anymore spreading weird theories about things people would not understand. We have arrived in the midst of society. If you look at the Facebook scandal, everybody is concerned now. This is the hour, people. This is the hour. <laughs> and if you're starting with shout outs, give one for Kirsten and Joe, the best management ever. And to Maurice Wessling, who invented all this. He had the name Edry perfectly right. He had registered everything in Holland, had all the ideas. He gave us the ideas and left. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo, 
That's what I wanted to say. We are now in the midst of society. And I just want to make one thing clear. Do you know what I did at Edry? Not policy, mm -hmm. not writing. I managed the mailing lists because I, because I knew to do that. <laughs> I managed the mailing lists, servers, and things, and kept myself out of the political decisions and left these to others because it was easy. The others would do it. <laughs> I didn't know, need to mix in. So I left the people to do their work, and where have we arrived? In the midst of society, and now is the our people. This is our hour. Our time has now begun, <laughs> not 15 years ago. It's now, because 15 years ago we were nothing, and now we are a force. It's amazing. It happens really, really rarely that you moderate a panel that has to do with digital rights, and it's so cheerful and empowering. So I think this is exactly the right spirit for the birthday party today. I would like to take a couple of minutes to sort of dip into the sort of national scenes that we come from, because we have, like I said, four different countries represented. <coughs> and maybe just do a little bit of a quick round of how you feel that our national digital rights landscapes have changed since the founding of EDRI. Let's start with you, Andreas. Ooh. Um, a two-minute overview of everything. Two-minute overview of everything. Time, I think <laughs> we had a lot of hope when, after 16 years of a conservative government, in 1998 we had a new government, and in 2002 we weren't as happy anymore because the new government didn't change as much as we had hoped for. Um, I'd say that has been the same ever since that we were more more pressing for for speed and we're not happy to see how long it takes but the realization that this is what politics is about that it's about the long-term marathon and not about the sprint uh, mm -hmm. was a very important lesson and uh, while i would like to say that in the national framework things have progressed to a better state they certainly have but not to the degree that we want but still and that's a message to all of you preaching to the converted. Uh, yield to the hands on imperative, keep going. Uh, it'll eventually, as we see now after 15 years, um, many things have changed to the better. And <coughs> I'd say mostly because the awareness is now there. So there's also other actors because no matter how strong you are, fighting the fight alone will not be possible. And I would say that definitely, I'm just going to chime on this quickly, seeing that we're from the same city. Um, it's, it's great to see in Germany how much, again, like sustenance and sustainability there is to s CCC <coughs> and, um, and organizations that have played a constituting role in IDRI, but also the landscape has really grown um, and diversified in Germany for other organizations, like organizations that focus on uh, liability and taking people to court, for instance, just to fill out the puzzle piece of the kind of NGOs that we need to do our job right. What is it like in the UK? Well, uh, <laughs> you took the word right out of my mouth. Um, uh, very well, simi very similar to Germany in one sense, because Ross and I and Caspar Bowden and um, Simon Davies and others who founded the Foundation for Information Policy Research, which was the first UK member of EDRI, um, uh, the Blair government came to power in 97, and we had high hopes that so the previous government had been pushing encryption restrictions and... and we, uh, Casper had done a great job. Um, w there was an organization called Scientists for Labor that Casper had been very involved in. He briefed the, mo I think maybe even Blair himself, uh, Ross, I don't, I don't remember, but certainly very senior people in, in the Labor Party. So they came in and of course, as always happens, um, they do some good things at first, including very importantly, um, making the European Convention on Human Rights enforceable in UK law, which has actually had the longest term impact. Thanks not least to Anna, Fielder and colleagues at Privacy International who brought all sorts of legal cases that have really had a big impact on that. Um, but over time, the same interests reassert themselves within government. So it is absolutely a, an eternal fight. It's not, you know, I'm a computer scientist as well. You know, we hope you get your, you get your code right, it compiles, and then no bugs left, everything's fine, you can sort of leave it. It's not how politics works. Obviously, it's an, it's an inter eternal battle. So that, that is why you, you need the long-term stability of EDRI and the, and the member organizations. Austria? 
Well, in Austria, I'm not sure if, if uh, so much changed. Uh, from, the, from the organizations that have been there, uh, when ADWI was founded, I think they have been quite stable still. Uh, they run on uh, volunteer work, and uh, so it's, it's not really predictable if uh, something gets done or it, it doesn't get done. It depends on uh, if somebody has time or not. But what really changed is I think that uh, with the campaign on the data retention directive, uh, we managed to, to establish a new organization. It was uh, at the time uh, Acker Vorrat Österreich, or Working Party on, on Data Retention Austria, uh, that I founded with a few colleagues, and uh, we uh, wanted to have a new thing to, to combine and to collect all the actors that have been present in Austria, that, but that have not been working well together in Austria. And so we said, this is such a huge thing. We need to address this together. We need to forget everything else and combine our forces and work on that. And this uh, worked quite well. We, we have been uh, tremendously successful on with, with our campaign, with uh, also the public outreach. We had no money uh, for any campaigning, but we, we collected over 100,000 signatures on a, on a uh, parliament campaign uh, for, for calling for the parliament to, to reject data retention and uh, to, to uh, oblige the Austrian government to, to vote against data retention on the European level. And uh, 100,000 signatures under such a thing is uh, the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest petition in Austria at that time. So mm -hmm. we now had a, had a bigger one, but uh, at that time we've been the, the biggest thing with really no money, just social media and good uh, communication. And uh, the lucky thing with that is it didn't collapse with the, with the win on the data di uh, retention directive, but it is the sustainable and uh, it now has professional staff and, and works on, on digital issues. And so we've got a, a good actor in, in Austria and still the other organizations still exist and still provide their knowledge, uh, their experience and, and everything they have. And that's the good thing. But still, uh, we need to improve. We, we need to, to get stronger and I'm sure we will. In the Netherlands. So uh, I've left Bits of Freedom a very long time ago, but uh, it's rebooted twice, Bits of Freedom, and now it's an extremely strong professional mm -hmm. organization with more than 10 people, uh, paid staff. But it's still tricky, you know, to, to find the um, money. And I've been hoping for a long time that uh, there would be a few Bitcoin millionaires that would donate a few <laughs> million to, to Bits of Freedom just to say, okay, the next 10 years, don't worry about money anymore. There must be those <laughs> Bitcoin millionaires <laughs> somewhere, <laughs> right? Why? Just give a few Bitcoins. You must have. Uh, and the other thing is that I uh, know from the charity world that um, many of the charities actually live of wills and legacies. And we're just a bit too young to, to, to live off the legacies and the wills. But, you know, in 20 years from now, when you draw your will, <laughs> or, you know, in, in the family, maybe discuss the issue of donating something to your national organization. But because it, it remains tricky, you know, there's a few great funders that ha help us all the time, many of us all over, same for Bits of Freedom. But I don't know, there's no structural income from donators. It's still difficult. But maybe now is the hour, like Erich said, if we uh, m you know, capitalize on this moment of anger about Facebook, maybe the donations will increase and then it will be stable in the long term. Thank yeah. You. Eric, since you share a home country, unless you want to add something to what Andrea said, I think I'd like to um, sort of start closing our round with a little bit of an outlook. You know, we've talked a lot about what's happened in the last 15 years and especially some of the major successes. Um, what is your hope? Where is Idri going to be in 15 years? And what do you think are going to be the topics that are going to be accompanying the organization and all our national organizations? Well, we will have the usual topics. If you look at the first Idri Gram, <laughs> things <laughs> haven't changed that much. <coughs> we were already fighting the same at the same front, people are fighting on these fronts now. In as to the future, well, the next big thing that's in the air is called cyber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's 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 just a word, and every everything is cyber here, cyber there, cyber cyber everywhere. But what's going on really behind 
uh, will make you quit laughing. There are things in development now as to so-called cyber warfare, which is no war at all, but it's a mix of psychological operations, information operations, as you see what the Russians do and what the Russians did. They played masterfully, but there are 15 or so countries behind them, and they're all doing the same leaving the criminal scene unattended, using them and building up the cheapest of all army forces, and these are the cyber forces. It's ridiculous <coughs> what it costs to set up a working cyber battalion that would spread disinformation, run psyops, hack things, publish things, and everybody does that. It's entirely unregulated, and the problem is what they call cyber, the fifth domain. Excuse me, that's our fucking domain, that's the internet. <laughs> they are playing their games on the internet now. You will see, I'm working on a, on a book on that, and I'm lecturing on this topic, you will see what will happen in during the next few years. There will be anarchy in the nets because there are so many powerful players in there and in the field of cyber, there are no superpowers anymore. There are no superpowers anymore in this field. Everybody is more or less playing at level as soon as you have a group of 100 or 200 well-trained people doing this, <coughs> you can't distinguish them one fr from another. And as this is entirely unregulated and undisputed, everybody does it, this will become a major problem, not in the distant future, but in the next two or three years. The North Koreans already started to develop a financial branch. You know what they do? Rob online casinos <laughs> and finance their cyber army by their gains. That's what's going on right now. Nobody cares for it. Everybody says cyber here, cyber there, cyber, cyber everywhere. What is this? This is what's happening right now, all the time, and is not viewed as a problem and is not viewed as a developing problem. Everybody does it and everybody, every politician looks at the other side. And this is the next thing that will come as a topic, as an every topic. I think everybody has been nodding along and there was a lot of agreement on the panel. So to end things on a cheerful note, <laughs> <laughs> I would like to ask if there's anybody who would like to volunteer a favorite anecdote, um, a moment of the last 15 years where you caught yourself um, thinking either, hey, this was a great idea and I was so, I'm so glad to have been a part of it, or something very unusual, unexpected, or funny that you would like to share as an Idri insider to close this panel. <laughs> well, let me give a national one. Um, and actually, it's not quite as sadly positive. Well, it is in the end, so it's a happy <laughs> ending. Um, so I, I was director of FIPA, and one of the things that, like, because as has been briefly mentioned, and you know, all the and activists in the room know, act, you know, that this is really, really hard to win these battles against very powerful interests, and sometimes it can be really depressing that you fight. So I was, I was, me and Simon Davies in the UK, and Ross and Casper and others were fighting for about eighteen months on data retention, <laughs> um, uh, where the UK government was trying to. Um, passed secondary legislation in 2003 requiring data retention. And we had got, Simon and I had got to the point where we had, you know, fought every second of the day for 18 months. And we were sitting in the House of Lords, our second um, chamber of parliament, 
with the Liberal Democrat Party, which is a small party in the, in the House of Commons, the elected um, chamber, but in the House of Lords ha is quite powerful. But not just the Lib Dems. We have persuaded the Conservatives as well to all turn up to vote against this then Tony Blair's government data retention legislation. And Simon and I were there to just basically pass brief notes to the, to the Lib Dems um, in for the debate, which we did in the morning. It all seemed to go very well. The Lib Dem Lord that we were working with introduced us to, a, to his colleagues over lunch and said, oh, very good, you know, we can see there's an, a majority in the chamber to vote down these, uh, this law. Simon and I said, wonderful, we'll go home and watch the vote in the afternoon. Got home and um, the Labour Party spokesman in the Lord stood up and said, we can see that we're going to be defeated on this this afternoon. However, um, it's a convention of the House of Lords that the opposition does not vote down these types of laws. In fact, it hadn't happened since the 1960s. And if you do that to us, you'll be in power again sometime, Conservative Party. We will vote against every piece of secondary legislation you bring forward. And the Conservative Party said, give us a moment. Came back. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 18 months. <laughs> so that was very depressing. <laughs> However, the happy ending is, um, thanks to uh, all of Edry's work on data retention, um, even, I mean, even after the Court of Justice decision, I went to meetings with some of Anna's colleagues with our home office, where I ended up, I'm slightly ashamed to say, shouting and swearing at the civil servants because they were just being so blind to what the Court of Justice decision had said and what they were still trying to push through Parliament. And then our national court said, uh, you know, so happy ending. <laughs> Wonderful. I have one. One minute. Are you sure? Do you all want to hear it? You all want to hear it, right? 30 okay. seconds. Vienna 2002, Liberty's last conference. First conference we did, and we managed to invite all the first, uh, well, first generation of Edris. They were there, and they were handed out some gifts and some things, and there was an envelope some of the participants would get from me. And I say, here's the emergency rescue envelope for you. Nobody knew what this was. Then Maryam Marsuki, the first president, came to me and said, <coughs> Why, what are you handing out here, Eric, to people? Uh, can I have one? I said, sure, you can have one. I just didn't know you'd like it. <laughs> and do you know what's inside? Miriam said, yes, of course, condoms. I said, no, <laughs> it was a bud of grass and three <laughs> leaves <laughs> to roll one at night if you get nervous. <laughs> On that very happy note, <laughs> I would say we'll <laughs> close the panel. Thank you all so much for coming here today and sharing your stories. Big round of applause for everybody. So whilst we leave the stage, I would like to invite Joe, Joe McNamee, who's the executive director of Edry, to come on stage and speak some closing words to the event. Okay, enough, enough, enough. Thank you. Edry in Brussels is a bit like an iceberg. It's really, really cool, but actually you can't see most of it. And the bits that you can't see are the member organizations. You can't see the vision that we talked about today of the people back in 2002 who could see all of this coming, who understood what opportunities there were and what threats there were. You don't see that the amazing expertise among our members that allow us in Brussels to, to do our job and to make it seem like we're the important ones. 
you don't see the, the passion driving national organizations and achieving absolutely unbelievable things. You don't see the, the stamina of groups that have no funds, that have no support, that, that believe and that push and that make things happen that are impossible. That's what EDRI is. Um, I uh, love the fact that I was sitting in the visible bit of the iceberg and that I get tons of credit for stuff that I didn't do. Um, <laughs> that's what Brussels is all about and why they <laughs> And for heaven's sake, why the hell shouldn't I? It's my turn. I've been here for 22 years. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, there's one person uh, who actually embodies the vision, the expertise, the passion, and the stamina, and the public service in the background um, more than anybody else. And that is our president of the past 10 years. So. Um, on behalf of the iceberg, the cool, the cool bits and the less cool bits, I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, thank Andreas Krisch for <laughs> for managing to do all of the things that he does, and beneath the um, the water line, somehow managing not to drown uh, in the process. So there is a box somewhere. Yeah. Andreas? <laughs> 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 Andreas? So thank you. <laughs> and and uh, and with that, I end the formal part of the evening, and you can now eat, drink, be merry, and be, as all of our uh, network is, terribly, terribly cool. And I'm asking every member and observer of EDRI to come up stage to have a photo of everyone, please. So let's have another big round of applause for Joe and all the team members of the Edry team for the fantastic work that they're doing. And whilst we're here gathering for our family photo, I want to say thank you also to everybody in the audience today, again, for coming and celebrating this 50th birthday of European digital rights with us. And also thank you for standing so attentively for the last hour with this family photo. We're also opening uh, for dinner and for drinks, so you can now feel free to move <laughs> and to get yourself food and refreshments. And also after the family photo, we're gonna start with the evening entertainment program. So we have three, ooh. We have three DJs here for you today. This guy, Marcus is gonna be playing. Edge is going to be playing and Mambo is going to be playing. So you hope we're going to stay with us to the very end of the evening and celebrate lots with us tonight. <laughs>